We're back. Welcome to the Healthcare Triage Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. We're going to do a week of questions and answers, and also there's so much news going on, just trying to catch up on a lot of the stuff that's going on. As always, we appreciate those questions. HealthcareTriage.info. Go there. Type them in. You'd be surprised how often you might get your question answered, because that's how much we care. News. There's so much news going on right now. First of all, the flu still sucks. I'm not going to spend the whole time talking about it, but man, it still sucks. I'm like 4,000 people. People are dying each week. It's a bad season. The flu shot, as we all know, is not as effective as we might like. Doesn't mean you still shouldn't get it. Please continue to practice good hygiene. Do not go out if you're sick. Do not go around near other people. Keep washing your hands. Protect those around you. It's a really, really bad flu season. But there's so much else going on in the news. First of all, they passed that budget deal not long ago. That had some interesting stuff in it with respect to a healthcare perspective. First of all, we were excited when the budget deal originally extended CHIP for like five or six years. Well, now CHIP's been extended for like a decade, which is great. So... Yeah. Of course, it wasn't a very big lift for them because at this point, pretty much extending to a decade almost saves money because not insuring those people would force them go to go on the exchanges where it could actually be more expensive for them to get care, especially since now we've gotten rid of the individual mandate in 2019. And we've talked about that so much. I'm not going to get into it in so, to, in so much detail here. But the bottom line is CHIP's going to be around for a while. We won't have to do another episode on how it might go away now for like 10 years. And Look forward to it then, but I will not. Anyway, what else is going on? We've had some interesting news with respect to Medicaid. There's been a recent push for waivers, especially with respect to work requirements. They came to our home state of Indiana to announce these with much fanfare. Look, it's not clear how much benefit we're going to see with respect to trying to implement these work requirements. It's not clear how many people they could actually apply to. It's not clear how much good they will do. All of our experience with putting work requirements on other welfare type programs have shown that we really don't get the benefit we thought we would. We don't save a lot of money. What we wind up doing is kicking a lot of people off the rolls. And that may be what some people are looking forward to with implementing these things on Medicaid. But since the vast, 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 vast majority of people on Medicaid can't work for a variety of reasons, be they people who are disabled, people who are retired, people who are stay-at-home mom or dads, they're students, or they're sick, or they have mental health issues. Most people on Medicaid can't work. And some of them are trying to get jobs and can't. So, you know, these kinds of things are not going to work. Regardless, we're doing them. In some states, they're even implementing these things. Some of them are trying like literacy requirements, which requires people maybe to pass a literacy test or to take a class on health literacy. It's so unclear that this would do any good. It's so unclear how this would be implemented, but they're going to find new ways to, to make it more difficult for people to be on Medicaid in the positive hope that it drives people to go get jobs and work, but the more likely outcome will be that many, many more people wind up dropping off of Medicaid. Idaho is somewhat bonkers these days, as our good friend Nick Bagley says. It's crazy pants. I believe that that is the official legal term he keeps using, crazy pants. Anyway, they are now like approving plans which clearly violate the law of the Affordable Care Act. Um, they are not covering all of the things that are supposed to be covered. They are illegal, as far as we can tell. And it's interesting to see what's going to happen here. It's difficult to tell, partially because... One, there are going to be lawsuits, as Nick would say, when, not if. But the broader issue is it's not even clear that private insurance companies will want to start issuing these types of plans. Because, of course, if they're illegal and they are someday found to be illegal, then they will have to make good on them or change them in some way that could wind up costing them a lot of money. They're not in the business of short-term gambles. So I don't know what's going to happen. I don't think many people know what's going to happen. But we are seeing now... Some states are going to try to push the boundaries of the Affordable Care Act, and given that it's up to the Trump administration and their Health and Human Services Group and their Justice Department to try to figure out what to do and how hard to enforce the law, no one really knows what's going to happen. These are interesting times. We will keep watching them. Anonymous asks, my father says therapists these days don't take insurance directly. They insist on being paid up front and letting you submit to the insurance in hopes of partial reimbursement. How can we work towards parity for mental health care when so much of mental health care exists only on private pay? Ah, oh, look, that's, I got to be honest, that's not been my experience. I've, you know, had the same therapist now, God, almost since I moved to Indianapolis for 13 years. And I will tell you, when I first moved here, it was much harder 
to get it covered by insurance. In fact, I had to pay really close attention each year to which insurance plan I picked for my employer. And I also had to make sure that they filled out all the paperwork correctly in order to make sure that they were getting reimbursed. No more. It feels like almost every insurance that I could pick up um, is, is covered by our local therapist. And I don't worry about them doing it because so much of this has been enacted into law with respect to mental health parity. Now, that doesn't mean everyone's experience is the same or that there wouldn't be other insurance or even Medicaid, which perhaps makes it more difficult, certainly, to try to get reimbursement. Um, and it is probably true that some insist on being paid up front and then you know, make you submit your claims yourselves. It could be because they're out of network. I don't want to minimize these difficulties, um, but the best thing I think you can do is cast your net a little bit wider. If you have private insurance, you should be able to go on their website and look up providers uh, and find out which providers are covered by your plans and should make it easier to go and get coverage. If you are on things like Medicaid, there's still ways to look up who might be accepting and then try to get into those therapists. It is, of course, harder. There is no question because there are always shortages of these types of services, which is perhaps our biggest issue is that as people start to use these more and more, we don't have the capacity. This is an access problem uh, to, to pick up all of the slack. So I sympathize. Um, I would encourage you to cast your net wider and to try to use probably some of the online resources that are available in order to, to, to find a therapist who might be able to help you. Dysgraphic Programmer asks, I am a noticeably overweight man. Several times I've had doctors fail to solve a health problem because they were stuck on weight-related issues only to have it be something else entirely. Several people I know have had similar problems. How common is this? How can I get my doctors to consider other causes? You know, this is this is a hard question to answer without knowing specific details. I'm going to answer this in two different ways. One is going to be in defense of your doctors, and then the second is going to be not so much doing that. One, doctors in general have to create what we call a differential diagnosis when they bring to you a health issue, when you bring to them a health issue. By differential diagnosis, I mean a list of potential causes for your problems, um, often ranked in terms of most likely to least likely. I don't know your individual situation, but it could be that when your doctor makes their list of potential causes and most likely to least likely, that obesity could be there, um, you know, sometimes with respect to pain, sometimes with respect to, you know, difficulty with exertion or other things that exist. Obesity can be a common and uh, reasonably thoughtful cause. That may not be the case, in which case now I'm going to give you the answer that's against. It may be that you don't have a good doctor. It may be that, um, you know, doctors are fixated on some issues. We've done an art. So most of my funded research is in trying to use clinical decision support and electronic health records to drive physicians to practice more evidence-based medicine. And some of the ways we do that is by trying to more thoughtfully question patients before they see the doctor about what are the health issues that they might have and then presenting these to the doctor in the effort to drive their conversations towards these health issues. And you'd be blown away by sometimes pushback, and we've even written papers about this, um, that sometimes doctors, when you even present them information about this is a big deal, this patient's in trouble, you need to do something about this, they want to stick to their sort of predetermined order of stuff that they want to talk about. That's a real problem. In fact, that paper is called, um, if I remember correctly, you can lead a horse to water, dot, 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 which did not make the doctors that, that we work with happy when we published that. But it's a real problem. Doctors are often fixated on what they want to talk about and sort of the priority list that they have in their head. And if it's obesity that they see as a huge issue and something they want to attack, they may be somewhat fixated on that. I, I think it's okay, though, to talk to your doctor about this, to point out if this has happened in the past, to ask them, you know, why why this might have happened or, or what else might be going on. It's also okay to get a new doctor if you feel like your doctor is not a good fit for you. There are lots of doctors in the United States. You might have the same issues that the previous questioner had in respect that you have to find one who fits in your plan and will accept your insurance. But if you don't like your doctor, talk to your friends, talk to your family, talk to the people you know, look for a better doctor. Kara Hutel, could, should infants, especially those born cesarean, be given probiotics? What about vaginal seeding? Weesh. Okay, so, of course, I think what you're getting at is that infants, amazingly enough, when they are born naturally through the vaginal canal, are, quote-unquote, infected with certain bacteria, which gets your 
immune track, not your immune track, your GI track going in the sense that like infants, when they come out of the, you know, amniotic fluid um, out of the uterus are somewhat sterile and they are immediately bombarded. And some of that is important because it gets them going in terms of building up the sort of microbiome that we all have. Those who are born cesarean section miss that trip through the vaginal canal. And there's a question of what we should do to perhaps get them going. Does this make a difference? We're still in the infancy of this. Like, we don't know. Um, some people favor giving them probiotics and the thought that that will get things going. Vaginal seeding would be trying to, like, almost, like, quote, unquote, infect them with the with the good microbiome stuff. I don't have a good answer for you because we don't know from res with respect to research. Um, I would say in general that there are not major studies showing the kids who are born cesarean section have such bad outcomes long term that could be fixed by this that we should start intervening in ways that we don't understand. Um, and so I, if one of my children had been born C-section, I would not have done this. Of course, you should make your own decisions. You should talk to your doctor uh, about what you would do. But in general, the, the proven benefits of probiotics are real only in a small number of cases or instances. The most common being diarrhea from antibiotics, uh, antibiotic-induced diarrhea, there does seem to be a benefit from probiotics. Outside of that, it gets a little bit sketchy. So uh, there might be one or other two tiny instances, but this is not one where we've really proven that there's a benefit. So Anonymous asks, what do you think of safe injection centers? And I hope you didn't think you needed to be anonymous to ask this question. So I'm assuming you're, you're talking about places where people can go to safely inject themselves with drugs in the thought that we would do, you know, perhaps reduce the risk of outcomes and potential overdoses and things like that. Look, I have done, we've done an episode on needle uh, exchange programs, and we've shown that that a lot of the, that they are cost not only cost effective, but perhaps potentially even cost savings. I think um, they certainly lead to often improved outcomes. There's a lot of interesting studies showing that safe injection centers work. The knock against them, of course, is that quote unquote we're promoting drug use, we're making we're normalizing it, we're making it better. But in terms of harm reduction, there are some compelling cases to be made that when this has been tried, it reduces bad outcomes and improves safety. That is the health argument. The moral argument is completely separate. And unfortunately, when we delve into these worlds, the moral argument comes into play because there's politics involved. Uh, if you're asking my personal opinion, I got to admit, you know, it's like I'm conflicted, but I think I've come down on the harm reduction side, that I'm willing to certainly try things and study them to see what the outcomes would be. So if we tried these programs and implemented them and found that they were leading to reduce deaths and not increase drug use, then that's great. If we did tried them and found that it did not do that, then we should not do it. So I'm in favor of trying these things and studying them to see if they're good. On a related subject, Anonymous asks, I don't know if it's the same one, do you think legalization of marijuana would reduce opioid deaths? So, Look, we're not going to get a randomized controlled trial here. It's never going to happen. We're not going to say like, hey, you get opioids and you get pot and let's see which of you dies. So the best we can go on is sort of epidemiologic data, cohort studies, what's been going on. And there's some interesting data coming out that shows that in states where the pot has been legalized, opioid deaths seem to be on the, on the decrease. So I think the truth of the matter is we're going to find out one way or the other because states seem to be marching in the direction of legalizing marijuana. And if we build up more and more data that differentially the states that legalize marijuana are seeing reductions in opioid deaths, it will be harder and harder to say that they don't. Um, there's certainly a compelling argument for why this might happen, that one of the few uses that has been proven in studies for marijuana is like, you know, reduction of nausea or pain um, in, in, in people who are being treated with chemotherapy and certainly some studies with respect to treating, you know, intractable pain and things like that, which is what we often use opioids for. So there's no question marijuana is safer. Uh, you know, again, by 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 the by dint of the fact that we're legalizing one and the other is still tightly controlled, nobody's overdosing from marijuana, and people are certainly dying of opioid deaths. So if they both can be used to treat chronic pain. It seems that one would be better than the other. I think we're marching in that direction with respect to medical use. We're certainly marching in that direction as well with respect to total legalization. So once we get there, this will be a moot question and we won't be discussing it anymore. Again, I hate, I always bring this up, but one of my you know favorite anecdotes is that during Prohibition, 
you could get prescriptions for alcohol, often for a lot of the same reasons that we often give out prescriptions for marijuana now. Do I do I believe people were treating things with alcohol? No. It was sort of the way that people got alcohol when it was difficult to get alcohol, medicalizing it. I think we're seeing the same thing with pot. This will all go away if and when pot becomes 100% legal. At that point, there will be no more medicalization of pot. Um, we will not be having these debates. Things will just go in a different direction. Michelle, are you aware of any research regarding childhood obesity and the risk for polycystic ovarian syndrome later in life? I know obesity is a risk factor for developing PCOS, but let's say that a female is obese as a child, loses weight in late teens, and is diagnosed with PCOS in early 20s. I don't know the literature well enough to say, but if you're looking back, if you're talking about yourself, part of me would be like, why are you worried about this? It is possible. I suppose that, you know, being obese earlier in life, even losing the weight might have placed you at higher risk for polycystic ovarian. But if you're if you're beating yourself up over this, what a waste of time. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, I have ulcerative colitis. I spend no time of the day worrying if I cause this or not. It doesn't matter. This is what I have. This is how it is. And I'm offended by other people trying to tell me I did something right or wrong to get or not get this disease. It is what it is. I don't think that laying blame one way or the other is beneficial to me or to society. And I don't enjoy in general when people try to say that people deserve to get sick or didn't deserve to get sick. I hope you're not doing this to yourself. And I certainly wouldn't tolerate if I saw anyone doing it to you. Now, if we're trying proactively to help people by reducing modifiable risk factors, so be it. Then we can talk to people rationally about changes that they might make in terms of trying to prevent diseases. But once they occur, dwelling on what you did and how much you are to blame serves no one. Noelia, what do you think about the arm implant as a birth control method? Is it true that it's been linked to a higher risk of osteoporosis? I think it's great. I think it works. I don't know of any evidence linking it to osteoporosis. And if it is, I don't believe it's a big risk because otherwise we would all know about it and we'd be pushing for other things. But long reversible birth control, LARCs are phenomenal. IUDs, the implants, they work hugely well. They help prevent unwanted pregnancy. I in fact, we just had an editorial in the New York Times, me and some colleagues, talking about that adolescents, even who've given birth in Indiana, don't have the right to consent to birth control themselves. It blows me away that an adolescent that we demand act like a mother and who has total control over her child's life still cannot consent herself without her parents, if she's a minor, to birth control after she's had a baby, like an implant, is mind-blowing. But such is Indiana, such is life in at least 11 other states. This is a phenomenal way to get birth control. Uh, my wife, who was up on a previous podcast, they, they do this. They do the implant. It works. It's, it's popular. I hope it becomes more popular. Elsie, I read the section on MSG in your book. And then Elsie says, well, the whole book, actually, she loves it. And I love you for loving it. But I've heard from many people that it inhibits the part of your brain telling you that you're so full you end up overeating. For example, I can't eat a whole bag of veggies, even if I like them, but chips with MSG, pile it on. I'm just curious if this is backed up by research or just another myth floating out there. Yeah, okay, first of all, it's a myth in the sense that it's the MSG and that it's working in your brain. What is not a myth is that... It's likely that the vegetables are not as tasty and therefore they're not activating the same parts of your brain or your, you know, biologic impulses to eat while MSG, it tastes delicious. I mean, it works for why it works. Those chips know what they're doing. They're getting you to eat more of them. Vegetables don't work the same way. Vegetables are just how sort of nature intended. Let us not kid ourselves. The MSG that is in snacks has been added there to get you to eat them. If you can control yourself and just enjoy the flavor periodically, so be it. But know that it's there. People are not putting it in and in, in using it as an ingredient in sort of food in general for that same effect. That's not why it's used so much in Asian food or Chinese food. They're not trying to get the same effect that they are with those chips. They're just making the food tasty. Um, there's a reason that earthy soups and other things that naturally have MSG taste so good. That's part of trying to get you to eat it as well. You know, breast milk has basically glutamate in it because it is one of the ways that evolution and nature have gotten breast, you know, infants to want to drink it. Um, it tastes good. It, it sort of hits those parts of our brains. It's not inhibiting your satiety. It's just tasty. 
and you like tasty things. You're correct that you must control yourself with moderation, as I think I stress again and again in the book, if you're going to indulge in things that have MSG, but it is not poison, it is not causing you to be unhealthy, you just sort of have to recognize that. But I would also argue that you have to control yourselves with everything that is perhaps tasty and not good for you. I love cheesesteaks, I love scotch, I love apple pie. Um, I don't argue that those things are, are like messing with my brain, they're delicious. And I just know that you can't just go with delicious, sometimes you have to make other choices as well. John, you've talked about how stretching before or after workout is not beneficial. Are you talking about static stretching only or all kinds of stretching, including dynamic stretching? I've heard that static stretching is no good, but my running coach insists on dynamic stretching before a long run. And I'm laughing because, man, people will jump through hoops to try to keep proving their own points. Look, the evidence shows that it doesn't really make a difference. This is the thing. In terms of injury... Um, in terms of preventing injury. Now, you know, if we get a bunch of pro star athletes in here and they start arguing that it improves their performance, maybe, even though the sort of the results are out on that. And look, who cares? I'm not, I don't care. If you want to stretch, stretch. Go ahead. You're weighing benefits versus harms, and there's almost no harm to stretching if you're doing it right. And if it improves your performance, if it gets you in the mo in the zone, if your coach wants it and your coach is obsessed with it, so be it. But there's just no scientific evidence that this is the kind of thing that prevents injury. When they've done the studies, and they I think some of them are even RCTs, and they get people to stretch or not stretch, the rate of injuries are not the same. I will also say that the um, performance stuff is equivocal. Like I think if I remember correctly, and check me if I'm wrong, and I will try to check this later. But I think it's like even if people who stretch couldn't jump as high, like in basketball. So it's like it's not necessarily a one-way street, but maybe it helps you run faster. I don't know. But but when people start jumping their hoops to say, like, well, my kind of stretching is beneficial, yeah, no, because they, they haven't gotten that detail. Alden G asks, do you think Maryland's all-payer rate setting would be a good policy to implement nationally? It seems that a lot of our problems with cost growth are due to provider price increases, recently driven by consolidation. It seems that all-payer rate setting would solve a lot of these problems. And you go on to say there are some downsides and what are you thinking of? You are going to love an episode we taped today, which is on why is healthcare cost so much in the United States. The short answer, you know, we'll give a spoiler to all of you, even though you'll know this inherently, it's the prices. And you're right, one of the ways to combat prices would be an all-payer rate setting, which Maryland does. Which And that basically means that what Maryland does is it gets together and sets the rates for what stuff costs. And that rate is the same for all insurers, private, public, doesn't matter. They control the prices. So insurance can still go out and try to, you know, you know, do its stuff for insurance companies. Doctors can still do what they do, but it sets the rate of prices so that we're not seeing that people are paid differentially. It also tries to control the high cost of healthcare. The downsides of this are that when you control the debt, the, you know, the price of healthcare, there are potentially some downsides. Not maybe there, maybe, maybe, maybe. There might be some less innovation, although, again, I'm not saying that there's a complete link there and you're going to see it. You will see a lot of doctors and providers and everybody else complain that they're not making enough and that is going to lead to restrictions and other things that are going to happen. And that sometimes does occur because, of course, there's the iron triangle. And when you decrease spending, you're going to in some way likely affect quality or access. And that's often what does happen. Um, on the other hand, you can control prices and you can keep spending from going up too dramatically, which is the plus. The biggest negative is that this is politically almost untenable. I mean, it's almost akin to single payer. It is not single payer, but the difficulties in trying to implement it would almost be the same politically as single payer because you get the same kind of people screaming and yelling about it, and that would be very hard to overcome. There's a reason that there's, it's only really in one state. That state is pretty blue, um, and it does appear to have worked somewhat, even though it's not perfect, but this certainly is one way to try to get a handle on, on high healthcare spending. Jeff Clark asks, my primary care provider is retiring. He's been my doctor for over 20 years. Is there a way to interview potential primary care doctors before choosing my next one? I'm looking for someone who can help with my mental health needs. I want to find a doctor that I feel like we're on the same page. Love the show and your book. We love you too. Thanks for all you do. Y yes, lots of doctors allow this. Now, good doctors allow this. I will say probably lots of doctors don't do this as well. In pediatrics, this is pretty common because you'll see parents that want to come in and interview doctors before they have their baby. So they they will sometimes schedule, you know, sort of interview visits while they're still pregnant, which of course don't last as long, but they allow docs to do this. Great pediatricians do this. Not all pediatricians do this. I'd say great doctors do this too, but not all doctors do this too. And part of it is, let's be, let's be honest, really great doctors usually have pretty full schedules and don't need to 
sell themselves. Um, it's just part of the thing. So my doc, like our pediatrician, um, is phenomenal, um, and often says she's not accepting new patients, but but anyone that asks me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's the best pediatrician in town. Drop my name, and I I think that sometimes leads to people accepting. I doubt she actually has to interview because she has no spots in her schedule and just doesn't need to be recruiting patients. But you should try. It's a good idea. Aerith asks, as a fellow gamer, do you have any insight or tips for dealing with simulation sickness? No, I wish I did. This, like, I'll be honest with you, games don't affect me. But on a recent trip to Universal Studios last year, for the first time in my life, I felt old because, like, I was on rides that were making me nauseous. Like, I would love to say I enjoyed that Simpsons ride, but I had to shut my eyes the vast majority of the time. And even, like, the Minions ride looked amazing, and I had to shut my eyes. I've never had that happen before. It was really, really, really bizarre, and it really upset me. Um... But, but I've never had this happen in a game. So now I'm going to give you the anecdote that I'm not going to recommend. In fact, I almost feel like I should say, let me tell you a story about someone else. But we went out for dinner, and uh, that person had a drink or two, and then went back on some of those rides and totally loved them. And I'm curious to know if alcohol might have interfered, and I'm not saying over drink, and I'm not telling any minors to do this, and I'm not advocating for drinking alcohol anyway, but I would love to look at the research and see if alcohol perhaps inhibits the sense of balance in such a way, or maybe disconnects it in such a way that it affects how easily you're responding to those simulation rides. And maybe you're not as able to, to do, I don't even know. Um, but it was interesting that that a drink or two made some of those rides less nausea inducing. Having said that, let me be clear again. I am not advocating that people drink before they, they, they try to overcome these simulation problems. There are worse things in life than not being able to go on some of those rides. There are plenty of other great rides to go on. Um, but, but I would be curious to look at the research. Ian asks, can you provide a refreshed view on wellness programs and whether the recent wave of digital apps and technologies have helped enhance these programs? Oh my God. No, they have not. We published a paper, I want to say like a year ago. I mean, I'm not talking like, you know, this literature is old. Um, me and Austin Fract and Nicholas Bagley and Adriana McIntyre published a paper, like my Ulysses on wellness programs. We reviewed all the evidence, all the data, all the law. And you should look up the paper because it is our it is our magnum opus, and it still comes down to the conclusion that those are not good investments. So no, nothing has changed. Lauren from St. Paul, healthcare isn't just doctors and nurses. So what are some interesting support professionals in the healthcare and biology fields? What are some example careers or degrees in hospitals, research assisting, outreach, etc.? Everything you just said: social workers, nutritionists, dietitians, therapists, physical therapists occupational therapists, people who study PhDs in almost every field you can imagine, health services researchers who aren't, you know, physicians, who have all kinds of other degrees. Everyone can be involved in healthcare. My wife, you know, was a guest on the show. She's a nurse practitioner, massively involved in healthcare. Although I guess you're right, she's a nurse. Um, you got to look into them yourself. But there's, there's so, remember, like one Six of our economy is healthcare. I promise you, doctors and nurses are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction. There's like 800,000 doctors, and I don't know the number of nurses, I got to be honest. But but look, that's a sixth of the economy is working in healthcare in some way. Doctors and nurses are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of it. You should, you should go well beyond that. Ryan asks, as a physician, how do you approach educated adults that believe unreasonable medical information? An individual in my life believes the vaccines can cause health problems and autism, a gluten-free diet is a panacea for numerous autoimmune diseases, and that bizarre supplements without any FDA evaluation can cure cancer and blah, blah. I'm not even going to read all these because they're perfect. Look, my flip answer is show them healthcare triage. Um, how do I do it? This is what I do. I mean, that's my raison d'etre. It's like, that's that's why I write for the New York Times. It's why I write at the JAMA Forum. It's why we make healthcare triage videos. It's why we do this podcast. Um, it's it's trying to correct through data and evidence and, you know, explaining why things are so and going to the research and explaining the reasons things are true as opposed to just sort of telling them that's the best thing I've got. You know, person to person, I try to do that patiently. I will own there are people I'm never going to reach. 
I've just accepted that. There are people who are true believers in the stuff I believe in, who are true believers in the stuff I don't believe in, who are never going to change. And that's, I don't want to say fine, but I accept it. I'm trying to reach those people in the malleable middle, and I try to expand that malleable middle in both directions by patiently trying to use data and evidence and logic and reason and, you know, humor to, to try to convince those people. It's why I wrote the book, you know, why I wrote my most recent book and the other books in general, and to do all this stuff, because I think we can change people's minds, but we have to do it patiently and kindly. Beating them over the head is not going to work. Punishment's not going to work. Yelling is not going to work. Scaring is not going to work. It just doesn't. In fact, so many of the efforts we've tried to combat myths, um, especially with respect to vaccines, have backfired. We've probably normalized vaccine denial by talking about it so much. So we just need to be calm and patient and keep working on it. Anonymous, does standing significantly burn more calories than sitting, or is it just getting up and walking around that's better? I think both. Both are better. But but let's be honest, neither burn significantly more calories. As we've talked about so many times, there are so many good reasons for you to exercise. Weight loss is not one of them. You're going to burn off some calories from walking or standing. It ain't that much. Um, it's not, you know, getting up and moving around. You're not, you're not losing weight and burning off calories. It's more reasons of, of you know, keeping from being sedentary and looking out for your health and being, you know, having good heart health and cardiovascular health and aerobic health and all the other benefits that you might get. Um, but that's not from weight loss and calorie burning. So do those things. Both are good. Standing a lot, walking out, they're both great. Don't do it for the calories that you're burning. Shannon asks, what are the odds of an adult experiencing sleep paralysis and the creepy hallucinations if they never had it before? I found some studies on prevalence online, but nothing about adult incidents. How much am I tempting fate when I read other people's terrifying stories of cackling demons sitting on their chest? It's so weird. I was watching cable news this morning, and for the first time ever, I saw like either like a law, it was a lawyer commercial or a medical trial commercial on this exact topic. And I'm wondering if like you saw this commercial and it's what's making you panicked about this, because I don't know. Um, really weird. I have not heard anything about this being more prevalent. I, it's just so weird to me that this question's coming through on literally the day I heard the commercial about it. So I don't know. I, I don't think you can catch this. I don't know about it. I, I wouldn't be too, con this sounds like the ring, you know, more than anything else. I don't think because you've seen the video, you're, you're tempting fate or because you've heard the story, you're, you're, this is going to happen to you. Um, especially if it's a biological cause, if it's more of a psychi psychological cause, then of course, you know, then, then mental stuff matters. Um, but I've not heard anything which would, would lead me to believe this is true. Of course, if you all start sending me research that says the opposite, I will bring it up next time and we will talk about it. But but this is not something that I know anything or that I've heard anything about, I should say. And I think that does it. Can't thank you enough for your questions. We need more of them. Again, healthcaretriage.info. That's the website or the internet address or whatever the young people are calling it these days. Go to healthcaretriage.info. Put your questions in. We're going to try to get to them. As always, we can't thank you enough for listening. We're doing this for free. But if you want to support the show, that's even better. You can go to patreon.com slash healthcaretriage and give us anything you like dollar a month, less, more, doesn't matter. Anything you do can help make the show bigger and better, and we appreciate all your support. Again, that's patreon.com slash healthcare triage. HTTMerch.com is where you can get your healthcare triage merch. You can also still follow us on Facebook. You can watch the show online. You can like us. You can do anything you like. And of course, my book, The Bad Food Bible, available wherever books are sold. I'd really appreciate your picking up a copy. Buy lots and lots of them and give them to all your friends. They'll love them too. Thanks for listening. We'll see you in two weeks.